to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me.
Numbers chapter 3 today, Numbers chapter 3 and chapter 4, we will continue where we left off last Sunday morning in a sermon, sermon entitled, Chosen to Serve. Chosen to serve because the Christian life is a life of service. That was not a new thought that was introduced in the New Testament, but all of those who follow Christ, those with their faith in Christ, those who trust God in both Old Testament and follow the Lord Jesus in the New, live lives of service. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, that you and I were chosen by God, not to be spectators, but we were chosen by God to serve. Albert Einstein and Albert Switzer and Mahatma Gandhi 
were three towering figures of the last century. Schweitzer was a brilliant German theologian and a professor, and he felt God was calling him to become a medical doctor so he could go to the mission field in Africa, open up a hospital, and begin to take care of the physical needs of individuals. So that's what he decided to do. As an adult, he went back to the school that he had left years earlier, and for seven years, he labored away in medical school, and all of his friends thought he was crazy for that. But eventually, he finished medical school. He and his wife moved their family to Africa, and there on the mission fields of Africa, he opened a hospital where he could serve the physical needs of individuals at the same time, share with them the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus, and for 40 years, listen, Four decades of his life, he served Christ on the mission field. He was chosen to serve. Gandhi, of course, was another towering figure who brought the um, British Empire to its knees as he, with his nonviolent approach, helped to uh, gain independence for India. And then, of course, the third one of the trio is Albert Einstein, the greatest scientist of certainly of his time and some would say of all time. It is said that through the life of Albert Einstein, that he had two portraits that were hanging on his wall that were inspiration to him. They both were men of science. One was Newton and the other was Maxwell. And they inspired him to do great things in the work of science. Well, toward the end of his life, Einstein took those portraits down and replaced it with two other portraits. The portrait of two great humanitarians, Albert Schweitzer and Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, Einstein said this, he said, early in my life I focused on success, but the older I've gotten, I've realized that true fulfillment is not in success as much as it is in service. We were created by God, not to just simply absorb, but to wring our lives out in service. John Wesley once said, do all the good that you can. By all the means that you can, in all the ways that you can, in all the places that you can, at all times you can, to all people that you can, as long as you can, you're chosen to serve. Jesus said it this way, every tree brings forth, or every good tree brings forth good fruit. Service is the fruit of the Christian life. Can I get an amen right there? Service is the fruit of a Christian life. James in the New Testament said, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. He said, faith without works is dead. It is simply a lip service if there is no physical service to accompany our faith. God has chosen you and I to serve. To serve him by serving others. Listen, we live in a self-centered world where it's easy to make it all about me, right? Me first, and it's all about me. But God says, no, it's not about me, it's about Him. It's not about you, it's about Him. And God has designed us and built us and crafted us and wired us to serve each other. And that's how we demonstrate we're serving God when we serve one another. In Numbers chapter 1 last Sunday morning, we looked at how God counted His people He counted them, found uh, some 600,000 adult males over the age of 20 that would serve in the military, basically. Uh, Once they moved out of Egyptian bondage and into the promised land or into uh, the wilderness wandering, I should say, there was upward of 2 million in totality. So in chapter number 1, God counted his people. And then in chapter 2, you'll remember, he arranged his people by tribes. He put three tribes to the north, to the south, and to the east, and to the west of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was to be in the center. God was saying to his people, I want to be the center of all that you do because only when God is the center does life really make sense. So in chapter 1... He counted his people. In chapter 2, he arranged his people. Now today, what you're going to see in chapter 3 and 4 is God chose his people. Chose them for a very unique role. He chose his people to serve. One particular tribe we're going to focus on this morning that gives us this beautiful picture of being chosen to serve is the tribe of Levi. 
And uh, uh, the name Levi trans is translated as joined or attached. You remember Levi was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Levi, his dad was Jacob, his mother was Leah. And just as Leah was attached to Jacob, we would say that Levi was attached to God. And the, the tribes or the descendants of Levi would be those who would perform the spiritual leadership duties for the Old Testament Jewish people. It would be the tribe of Levi that would stand head and shoulders above all the others as, listen now, the priestly tribe. Now, not every person who was a Levite was a priest, but every priest had to be a Levite. All right, let me say that again. Not every Levite served as a priest, but every person who was a priest had to originate from the tribe of Levi. There were some famous biblical characters from that tribe. For example, Moses was from the tribe of Levi. Aaron was from the tribe of Levi. John the Baptist in the New Testament was from the tribe of Levi. Uh, remember when Jesus was calling his disciples, he called a tax collector. His Greek name is Matthew. What was his Hebrew name? Levi, that's exactly right. He got that name because he was a descendant from the tribe of Levi. So these were a, a very special group of people that God was going to call to serve him in the area of sp spiritual leadership. You remember when Jesus was alive, when we went through his trial and his ultimate crucifixion, that the high priest of that day was a man named Caiaphas. When we were in Israel, we got to go to the home of Caiaphas to the dungeon where Jesus would spend his final hours before he would go to the cross. Caiaphas was a descendant of Levi. He was the high priest. So all the priests were ultimately descendants of Levi. So as we move through this story this morning, I want you to notice how that these Old Testament priests that God points out to us parallel the New Testament Christian life that you and I are to live, which again is to be a life of service. So as we look at these priests through the tribe of Levi, the first thing I want you to note is how the priests were chosen by God. If you will notice verse 5 says, the Lord spake to Moses saying, bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest that they may minister to him. So here you have God and his sovereignty. He is choosing a particular tribe to be his spiritual representatives. Now from that point forward, no one else could be a priest. It had to be from the tribe of Levi. In other words, you couldn't go to school to become a priest. You could not choose the priesthood as, a, as an occupation or a career path. You had to be a descendant of Levi. Well... Here's the rub. Uh, as that progressed year after year after year, in A.D. 70, Titus the Roman destroyed the city of Jerusalem. When he destroyed Jerusalem, the temple was burned to the ground. The temple housed all the Jewish genealogical records. So after the temple was destroyed, the Jews no longer knew which tribe they belonged to. So those who were the Levites no longer could trace their ancestry back to Levi. So because the temple was destroyed, because the priesthood had now come to a grinding halt, the Jews would no longer offer any sacrifices. They've not done that since A.D. 70 all the way up until this present day. But one of these days, the Bible says there will be a new temple built in Jerusalem. When the new temple is built, this will be during the tribulation period, after the rapture of the church, when the new temple is built, once again, the priestly tribe will be reconstituted and begin to offer sacrifice again. So you say to me, well, Pastor Darrell, if nobody knows who the Levites are today, nobody knows their ancestry or their genealogical record, how could they ever be reconstituted into a group of priests that could perform the sacrificial duties again? Well, that's a great question, isn't it? I want to read to you an article that I ran across that comes from the Israeli News. It is dated September the 30th, 2015. 
Now, I, I could tell you that I'm just really smart and I read the Israeli news on a regular basis, but that's not the case. I just happened to run across this in some of my studies, and I thought it was fascinating. So I've lifted a couple of paragraphs, and if you would be so kind as to listen very intently, I just want to read you this paragraph. You can Google this and look it up for yourself. The title of the article is, DNA Studies Trace Jewish Priestly Lineage from Biblical Times, all right? DNA studies trace Jewish priestly lineage from biblical times. Quote, scientists have discovered a gene which can be traced from the biblical figure of Aaron, the first high priest of the Jewish people, to a segment of the Jewish population today which carries the priestly lineage. The nation of Israel's priestly class, which is passed down from father to son, began with Aaron. Despite 2,000 years of diaspora, modern science has now proved that the biblical concept of Jewish priests has genetic evidence which has allowed the priestly heritage to maintain its integrity, leading to speculation that when the third temple is built, modern-day priests will be fully qualified to preside over rituals and rites. While it may sound a bit like science fiction, gen geneticists have verified the link which connects the present-day group of men classified as priests to the biblical figure of Aaron, who lived over 3,000 years ago. Demographic studies have shown that the priests have always represented approximately 5% of the total Jewish population. According to Jewish law, Jewish identity is determined by the religion of the mother. But the priestly designation and tribal identity have always been determined by the father. Since the designation of being a Levite is passed from father to son, the gene is found on the Y chromosome which is inherited only from the father. Genetically speaking, women have two X chromosomes, one from each parent. Men have X chromosome inherited from their mothers and a Y chromosome inherited from their fathers. Since Y chromosomes are passed from father to son, all Levite males should, in theory, have almost identical Y chromosomes. A particular genetic marker on the Y chromosome was detected in 98.5% of the priests and in a significantly lower percentage of non-priestly Jews. Based on the mutations found in the genes, scientists placed the original priest, the first common ancestor, at approximately 3,300 years ago, a timeline that fits neatly within biblical parameters of the lifetimes of the first priestly family. There are many disputes surrounding the third temple and much work to be done before it can become reality. However, as hundreds of Jewish priests gather at the Western Wall on the third day of the Jewish holiday of Sukkot or Tabernacles to bless thousands of Jews in a tradition passed down for millennia, the scientific proof of the legend of the Jewish priests shows one thing is sure. The priests are here and are ready to begin work. End of quote. Now, I read that article and I found that fascinating because to me, it just simply offers additional validation to what God has already said in His Word. That at the end of, of days, that God will reconstitute this Levitical order and once again, they will begin to offer sacrifices just like they did before the temple was ever destroyed in A.D. 70. God chose His Levite group then, His priestly order then, and He will reconstitute them in the middle of the Great Tribulation. So that is the, the, the priest who were chosen. They were chosen by God. They had to be descendants from Levi. So I told you that Moses was a descendant. Aaron was a descendant. Aaron would become that very first high priest. All of his sons then were eligible to become priests because they were all ultimately chosen by God. Now, not only were they chosen, but secondly, I want you to know that the priests were chosen to serve, all right? They were chosen to serve in the work of God. What kind of work did they do? Look in verse 7. They shall keep his charge and the charge of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of the congregation, underline this phrase, to do the service of the tabernacle. You see it again in verse 8. They shall keep all the instruments of the tabernacle of the congregation and the charge of the children of Israel. Here it is. To do the service of 
the tabernacle. Some translation render that word service as the word work. It's the, it's the Hebrew word aboda, and you find it in verse number 8. You find it in verse number 7. If you drop down to verse 31, you find it again. The very last sentence or partial sentence in verse 31, and the hanging and all the service thereof. When God called together the spiritual leaders of Israel, he gave them a very unique service. They were not, again, they were not to be spectators. The same is true for us when we worship. We are not simply spectators who come to listen as the choir sings or comes to listen as the preacher preaches. No, we come as active participants and we are engaged in worship and and our heart is to commune with God in worship. These priests were not just priests who serve with lip service, but they were actively engaged in the work of God. You follow the same flow to chapter 4. Look in chapter 4 and verse 4. This shall be the service of the sons of Koath. We won't read it all, but you'll find Aaron's descendants and other descendants are named here in chapter 3 and 4. They were to do the service in verse 4. Go down to verse 24 of chapter 4. Verse 24, this is the service of the families. Go to verse 28. Again, this is the service of the families. Go to verse 33. Again, you find it. This is the service of the families. What is the point here? That these Levite families had a very unique role in service to God. What were some of the things that they were responsible for? They were responsible, for example, leading worship uh, in music, either vocally or with instruments. That was the Levite's task and role. They were responsible to dismantle the tabernacle when the Hebrews and the wilderness moved to a different location. They would dismantle the tabernacle. In fact, when you read chapter 3 and chapter 4, you will find that each member of those families had a unique role. One would roll up the curtains. One would take down the tent stakes. uh, One would handle the ark. They all had a unique role because they were all engaged in a service because God didn't want a single one of them to be passive spectators who sat with their arms crossed and just watched other people do the work and to do the service. God says, no, I've chosen you as my priest and I have chosen you to do my my work of service. So the priest had multiple roles that they performed, among leading worship in music, among dismantling and erecting the tabernacle. The high priest also served on the Day of Atonement to make a sacrifice for the sins of the people. So God chose them to work. He chose them to serve. Now let me ask you a very important question. Why do you suppose God chose the Levites, have 12 tribes that he could have picked from. Why do you suppose God chose the 12? I mentioned this in the 830 service, and then uh, after the service, my wife said, "Uh, you know, I didn't know that. And I said, touche. All right? Why do you suppose that he chose the Levites? Look in verse number 11. Go back to chapter 3, verse 11. The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites... I've chosen them from among the children of Israel. So we know that he's done that, right? He chose them. He's taken them from the the children of Israel. But now look at this side note. Instead of all the firstborn that opens the womb among the children of Israel, therefore the Levites shall be mine. Because all the firstborn are mine, For on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I hallowed unto me all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. Mine they be, I am the Lord. And if you'll go down to verse number 41, he says it again. Thou shalt take the Levites for me, I am the Lord, instead of the firstborn among the children of Israel. So here's what's happening. Did you know originally the spiritual leaders of Israel was to be the firstborn of every family? You remember when the death angel passed over Egypt the uh, day of the great exodus? Uh, The Bible says those who had the blood of the lamb applied to the doorpost of their home, the firstborn was spared. If they did not have that lamb, which 
which symbolized belief in God's promise that he would send a substitute, if they didn't have that blood applied, then the firstborn of their families would be slain. So when the firstborn was spared and they come out of Egyptian bondage, God says, I'm going to use the firstborn of every family to be the spiritual leader in Israel. But now when you get to the book of Numbers, he changed it, didn't he? Again, notice, uh, he says, I have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of the firstborn. So let me ask you, why the change? Why is it not going to be the firstborn as the spiritual leaders? Why is it going to be the Levites? Do you remember when Moses went on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments from God? He was there for 40 days and 40 nights. He had fasted and he had prayed and God was going to give him the Ten Commandments, the law for the people of Israel. Moses was on the mountain, again, 40 days. And during that time, the Hebrews that were encamped along the base of the mountain became restless and someone said, Moses is never coming back. We need to get a new leader. And they called Aaron, Moses' brother, and they said, we want you to build an idol for us to worship. This is amazing, isn't it? Because they had just gotten out of Egyptian bondage. They just saw the mighty hand of God part the Red Sea. And now they say to Aaron, we want you to build a, a, a God, a golden God that we can worship. Aaron is reluctant at first, but then he finally succumbs to their pressure. He gets all of their jewelry, all of their bracelets and their earrings and all their rings, and he melts the gold down into a melting pot, and he molds a golden calf like they had saw in Egypt years earlier. And the Hebrews are dancing around this golden calf, and they're bowing down to pay homage to this golden calf. And when Moses came back down from the mountain, he was disgusted by what he saw. And God was disgusted by what he saw. Do you know, out of the 12 tribes, the only tribe that did not worship the golden calf, guess which tribe? tribe of Levi. That's exactly right. The firstborn of the family, they went right along. So God said, I'm not going to use the firstborn as spiritual leaders any longer. I'm going to use this one tribe that maintained their purity and did not worship that golden calf. So that's why the change is reflected. God chose the priest and then he chose them to serve. He gave them many different duties to be the spiritual leaders among God's people. So they were chosen by God. They were chosen to serve. And then let me finally tell you this. They were chosen for a temporary service. Of all the Hebrews were to do, it was not going to be a permanent occupation or a permanent role. It would be something that is temporary. Why do I say that? The Levitical priesthood was never intended to be permanent. Never intended to be permanent, and I'm going to show you why. Take your Bible, turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 7. If you're listening, say amen. Hebrews chapter 7. And look with me in verse number 11. Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 11. Hebrews 7, 11. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there, now look at this, that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which the tribe of Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood. Here's what the author of Hebrews is saying. Remember I told you that Caiaphas, the high priest, in the day that Jesus was arrested and crucified, Caiaphas had a problem with Jesus claiming to be a religious leader because Jesus' ancestry did not go back to Levi. Jesus' ancestry went back through the tribe of Judah. So Caiaphas would say, he's not a a priest after the Levitical order, therefore he is disqualified. 
But the author of Hebrews would later say, oh no, Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. He is from a higher priestly order, the priesthood of Melchizedek, who is another sermon for another time. You just have to trust me on this, that uh, it's an indication that Jesus, long before Levi was born, long before Judah was born, long before Abraham was born, Jesus was one with God the Father in glory. So, so there is a change in this, in this priestly order now because the original Old Testament Levitical order was never intended to be permanent. It was to be temporary. A couple of more passages I would like for you to turn to. Go to chapter 4 here in Hebrews. Look in verse 14. Hebrews 4 verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, notice, who is our high priest? It is not Aaron, notice, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. The Levitical priesthood was part of the Old Testament system of worship that has now been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus in the New Covenant. He is now our high priest. Let me say that again. In the Old Testament, Aaron was that first high priest. In the New Testament now, Jesus is our high priest. How do we get to God? We come to God through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary and his finished work. The Bible says that when Jesus died on the cross that the veil in the temple was torn in half. Not from the bottom to the top by the hand of man, but from the top to the bottom by the hand of God. And when the temple was divided, the, 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 the veil in the temple divided, that gave man access to come right into the presence of God through Jesus, our high priest. And if Jesus is our high priest, what does that make us? Now remember, if Aaron was a high priest, his descendants were priests. If Jesus is our high priest, what does that make us? Turn over a couple of pages to 1 Peter chapter 2, and we will close. 1 Peter chapter 2, look in verse 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen generation. Chosen what? Primarily chosen to serve. Chosen to serve. He says you are a chosen generation. Generation. This can be translated as God's treasured possession. You are a chosen generation. Now look at this. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. King James says here, a peculiar people. And we would say that some are more peculiar than others, right? But we are a peculiar people. A chosen priesthood. A royal holy nation. Look at this, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here's the thought this morning, all right? That word priest, the Latin word is, is pontiff, and it means, it means to, take, to take God with one hand and to take man with the other and to bridge the gap. That's what the priests were to do, is to take God in one hand and man in the other hand. And as followers of Christ, that's what you and I are to do in our service. When you, when you serve others and you help others and fulfill the law of Christ when he took that towel and he girded himself and he washed the feet of the disciples, he was leaving us that great illustration that we serve the Father by serving one another. And when we serve each other, what we're doing is I'm taking you by one hand and we're taking God by the other hand. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And that's the priest's role. That's our role now. That is our function. So when you feed the hungry, when you clothe the naked, when you serve in a role in the kingdom of God, you are serving as a priest. You are chosen for that role. If it is to work in the music ministry here, if it is to serve on a committee, if it is to work in a social committee or the choir, whatever it might be, to teach in our Sunday school, what you're really doing is taking people by one hand and God by the other hand. And you're bridging that gap so they can get a good picture of who God is. That's what Jesus has done for us. And that's what he asked us to do for others. John MacArthur lists several, uh, seven sacrifices that Christians make as being part of the royal priesthood. I'm just going to read them to you as we close. Our bodies, 
Romans 12, 1. Our praise, Hebrews 13, 15. Our good works, Hebrews 13, 16. Our generous giving, Hebrews 13, 16. Our converts, Romans 15, 16. Our love, Ephesians 5. And our prayers, Revelation 8, 3 and 4. So I said at the beginning of the message that service is the fruit of every Christian. So if someone walks by your life, can they tell by the fruit that you're bearing that you're actively engaged in the service of God? Because indeed, service is the fruit of a Christian. Someone has written a little story about, it's entitled, Ten Little Christians. Maybe you've heard this before, but to me it is a challenge of how we can either be bridge builders or we can tear down what God wants to do. Listen to this. Ten little Christians came to church all the time. One fell out with a preacher and then there were nine. Nine little Christians stayed up late, one overslept on Sunday, and then there were eight. Eight little Christians on their way to heaven, one took the low road, and then there were seven. Seven little Christians chirping like chicks, one didn't like the singing, and then there were six. Six little Christians seemed very much alive, one took a vacation, and then there were five. Five little Christians pulling pull in for heaven's shore. One stopped to rest a while, then there were four. Four little Christians, each busy as a bee. One got his feelings hurt, and then there were three. Three little Christians couldn't decide what to do. One couldn't have his way, then there were two. Two little Christians, each one, one more. Now don't you see, two and two make four. Four little Christians worked early and late. Each brought one, and now there were eight. Eight little Christians, if they double as before, in just seven Sundays, we'd have 11,024. In this little jingle, there is a lesson so true. You belong either to the building or to the wrecking crew. So God has called us as priests to be a chosen generation, a holy nation, that would serve people by taking them by one hand and God in the other and bridging the gap and showing the world the difference that Christ has made in our lives. Listen, isn't it fun to serve Jesus?